take long distance communication for granted. With so many different methods available, telephone, Skype, Zoom, text, it's easy to forget that at one time, the only communication possible for people at a distance were letters sent by mail, physically carried from one locale to another. Thousands of scientists and researchers have contributed to this modern world of instant communication. But looking back, it is the work and achievements of Italian inventor and entrepreneur Guglielmo Marconi that ushered in this modern age. Marconi was the first to develop and market the wireless radio system at the turn of the 20th century. He was born into a noble family in Bologna in 1874, educated as a youth by private tutors and ultimately attended the Livorno Technical Institute and the University of Bologna. As a student, Marconi became fascinated by Hertzian waves, named after the scientist who discovered them. We now call them radio waves. Marconi's work enabled these waves to be used to communicate Morse code signals at long distances. Prior to his work, radio waves were thought to travel in straight lines, only for short distances. He developed machines and techniques that eventually allowed these waves to cross the entire Atlantic Ocean. He discovered that while the waves do travel in straight lines, they can be bounced off the upper layers of the atmosphere to span great distances. He also discovered that radio waves travel better at night. He brought his research to the Italian government, but he was ridiculed and rejected, so he sought support in England. The British Postal Service was especially interested in his work when he arrived there in 1896. Within two years, his wireless messages were being sent to the Queen's Royal Yacht from a station on the Isle of Wight. By 1901, he successfully sent radio messages across the Atlantic Ocean. He discovered that the height of the transmitting antenna was a crucial factor. He tried numerous methods, but for his first successful test, the antenna was carried into the sky by a kite. Shipping lines soon realized the importance of Marconi's work for passenger communications, navigation reports, and distress signals. Marconi patented all his inventions and devices and formed the Marconi Company. He provided the radio equipment and radio operators that were placed aboard individual ships. Marconi also created a series of coastal radio stations to receive the ship's signals. One of these stations was in Babylon, Long Island. The original building has been taken over and restored by the Rocky Point Historical Society. Radio equipment quickly became standard on all ships. When the Titanic sunk in 1912, its Marconi operator was able to send distress signals to the Carpathia, who picked up 700 survivors. Marconi received many awards for his work, including a shared Nobel Prize in 1909. He was appointed a Knight of the Royal Victorian Order in the UK, and he was made a Marquess by King Victor Emmanuel of Italy. He was appointed President of the Royal Academy of Italian Science, and was also an Italian Senator. He died in 1937. Today, he is still celebrated by many on the anniversary of his death. Radio clubs all over the world observe two minutes of silence in his honor. Thank you, Guglielmo Marconi. The Nuclear Age, with all its terrors and all its blessings. The secrets of the atom and its awesome possibilities began to be unraveled when Albert Einstein first published his famous theory of relativity in 1905. Enrico Fermi, an Italian-American scientist born in 1901, 
was destined to become an important figure in the development of the nuclear age. Enrico showed signs of his genius when he was very young. At a local market, he found an old copy of a 900-page physics book from 1840, and he read it and understood it. His parents nourished his interest by giving him books on physics and mathematics. Though he attended the secondary school in Pisa, he was largely self-taught. In fact, he placed first in the entrance exam, and school officials were quite impressed with his analysis in solving the partial differential equation for a vibrating rod. After enrolling, the director of physics often asked Fermi to teach him something and give lectures to other students. At age 24, he became a professor at Sapienza University in Rome. He studied quantum mechanics, atomic theory, and relativity. In 1929, Mussolini appointed him to the Royal Academy, but Fermi later opposed fascism for its racial laws as he was married to a Jewish woman. He received the Nobel Prize in 1938, but left directly from Stockholm to the United States, where he eventually became a naturalized citizen. When he arrived in the U.S., five prestigious universities immediately offered him professorships. He chose to work at Columbia University in New York. A few years later, during World War II, he developed the first nuclear reactor at the University of Chicago. It was called Chicago Pile One, and it reached critical power on December 2, 1942. For secrecy, it was built under the university's squash courts. Fermi was asked to be present when the Oak Ridge reactor became operative. His fame as a physicist was well known to the government, so he was then asked to join the Manhattan Project, where he led his own department. He was present at the Trinity test of the first atomic bomb. As part of the panel that advised the government on target selection, he advised the A-bomb should be dropped on an industrial target. He was surprised to hear about Hiroshima and Nagasaki on the PA system as he worked in the technical area. After the war, Fermi became part of the Atomic Energy Commission. He was also a fantastic and gifted teacher. Fermi tutored or influenced eight young researchers who went on to become Nobel Prize winners. He died of cancer at age 53 at his home in Chicago. My name is Antonio Meucci. I come to this country in 1850. We were living in Cuba, but because my friend Giuseppe Garibaldi had taken part in many revolutionary activity in Italy and South America, the government was watching us. We thought it would be best to leave. Garibaldi also came to the United States. We all live together in our house at Boris Staten Island in New York. I made much money in Cuba. I worked for the Grand Teatro Tacón in Havana, one of the greatest theater in all the America. I rebuilt the theater after a big hurricane, and I also built a water purification system for the city. I worked at theater before, in Firenze, Italia, at the Teatro La Pergola. There, I invented what they call it today, an acoustical telephone. You see, I'm an inventor, and also a scientist. I study at the Great Academy of Fine Art in Firenze, Italia, where I was born. I'm proud to say I was the youngest student ever admitted. I study chemical and mechanical engineering. In Cuba, I became interested in the healing possibility of electricity and magnetism, two new areas of science at the time. In 1849, just before I left Cuba, a man who suffered from migraine headaches 
asked me to cure him. I had him hold a low voltage wire and put an arc a wire in his mouth while I went into a distant part of the house doing the same thing. When I turned on the voltage, I heard him scream in pain. The sound was transmitted to the wires. I discovered the basic principle of what is now called the telephone. I call it then teletrophono. When we got to New York, I bought a house in Staten Island. I invested much of my money in a candle factory a brewery. I had to develop a new smokeless candle and I hope it will make much more money for me and for the other Italian immigrants I helped when they come to America. Unfortunately, it did not work out very well and I went to bankrupt. Luckily, when they took ownership of my house, they allowed me to live there. But the truth is, that I've been tricked by people who claim I owe their money. My wife, at that time she was ill, I could not leave her bed. I made a device using the electric principle. I discovered in Cuba four that called me while I worked in the factory. This was 1856. Alexander Graham Bell, who later stole my idea, was only nine years old then. I keep improving my invention. By 1870, I made it totally different models, and the last one who walk over the distance of a mile. In 1871, some friend and I formed the Teletrophono Company. We filed papers with the U.S. Patent Office, and the next year, we went to the Telegraph Company to test my telephone over the telegraph wires. They took all my papers all my drawing and give me a laboratory to share with a young inventor named Alessandro Graham Bell. I waited for two years for the test, but it never happened. And when I asked for all my paperbacks, they told me they were lost. There was nothing I could do at the time. I let my patent application lapse. A while later, Bell filed for a patent for the telephone. I, of course, took him to court for the rights of my invention. Unfortunately, I died before the case was finished. It was a job, a bell got the patent. I never made the money from my telephone invention. However, thanks to some wonderful American and Italian descent, in 2002, Congress passed a resolution stating that I should be recognized and my work with the telephone should be acknowledged. They even say that if I renew my patent claim, Bell will never have gotten the patent. The truth always come out, no matter how long it takes. I'm thankful for that. I wish you could call me, and I will tell you more of the many inventions I made it when I was alive. He's been called the father of modern science and the father of modern astronomy. His discoveries and inventions are as important to the scientific community today as they were 400 years ago when he was alive. At a time when all of Europe was enthralled in the renaissance of art and culture, he turned his gaze to the heavens. Punished by the Inquisition for spreading the truth about the nature of the universe, he nevertheless remained a profoundly devout Catholic his entire life. His name? Galileo Galilei. Galileo was born in Pisa in 1564. His father was a famed lutenist, and his father's understanding of the mathematical nature of music had an influence on young Galileo. He had originally entered Pisa University to study medicine, but he was drawn to the study of mathematics. He went on to become the chair of the mathematics department at the University of Pisa and later became the chair at the University of Padua. From 1589 to 1610, he performed experiments with falling bodies that made his most significant contributions to physics. He disproved the theories of Aristotle in his manuscript called On Motion. Legend has it that he dropped different sized weights from the Tower of Pisa, but authorities believe the experiment was carried out by others to test Galileo's ideas. Nevertheless, his theories revolutionized physics. 
In 1581, while studying medicine, he observed the motion of a swinging chandelier. This stimulated him to propound theories that would lead to the creation of pendulum clocks and also a theory of the phenomena of ocean tides. Galileo's pendulum still hangs at the university. In 1609, Galileo became fascinated with the new Dutch invention of the telescope. He began building his own and soon he had a profitable business selling them as spy glasses to merchants as a navigation aid to ships. Then he turned his own telescope to the sky. He discovered the four moons of Jupiter, and after studying the movement of the planets, he concluded that the Earth and the planets revolve around the Sun. Copernicus had already developed the same theory, and this theory was condemned by the Catholic Church as being foolish and absurd in philosophy and formally heretical since it explicitly contradicted the Holy Scripture. In 1616, Galileo was ordered by the Church not to hold, teach, or defend in any manner Copernican theory. For a while, Galileo obeyed, but in 1632, he published a piece which compared the Copernican theory to the Aristotelian theory. However, the character in the book who supported Aristotle's theory was named Simpleton. Galileo was brought before the Inquisition and threatened with torture and forced to admit that the earth was the center of the universe. He was sentenced to house arrest for the remainder of his life and legend has it that he muttered, and yet it moves, as he left the courtroom. It wasn't until 1835 that the Catholic Church dropped its opposition to Copernican theory. Galileo invented many other devices that proved quite useful, including a thermometer and navigational instruments. His contributions to mathematics, astronomy, physics, and cosmology have made him a giant in the history of science. modern world, batteries are everywhere. They are a necessity for the myriad electronic devices we use, from TV remotes to toys and flashlights and a thousand other things. Global battery sales doubled in the period 1997 to 2016, with the AA size being the most popular. You don't have to get off your chair to change the channel or volume of your TV like you did years ago, thanks to your battery-powered remote. We owe all this convenience and commerce to Alessandro Volta, who invented the electric battery way back in 1800. His fellow scientists immortalized his name by calling the unit of electromotive force the Volt. Born in Como, Italy in 1745, Volta was encouraged by his family to study law and by his teachers to enter the priesthood. He became fascinated with electricity and by age 14 he had decided to study physics. He did not pursue university studies, but rather he began by corresponding with other scientists studying electricity and a wealthy friend, Giulio Gattoni, allowed Volta to use his personal physics laboratory for experiments. In 1769, Volta wrote his first scientific paper, a theory on the forces of electrical fire. By 1774, Volta was appointed professor of physics at the secondary school in Como, and soon after invented a device called the electrophorus. This device produces a static charge of electricity and can transfer electrical charges to other objects. However, Volta later discovered a similar device had been previously invented in 1762. After observing bubbles rise to the surface in a marshy swamp, Volta discovered and was able to isolate methane gas. Using the research of Ben Franklin from America, he learned how to ignite the gas in an enclosed chamber, creating a device known as the voltaic pistol. 
This device has been called the predecessor of the internal combustion engine. His reputation as a scientist was growing steadily, and by 1778 he was offered a professorship at the University of Pavia, where he taught for almost 40 years. Even though he was already famous, his greatest invention, the voltaic pile, did not come until 1800. Another great Italian inventor, Luigi Galvani, believed that he had found a new form of electricity, which he called animal electricity. Volta disproved Galvani's theories with the creation of the voltaic pile. He built the device to show that generating electrical current did not require animal tissue. Volta's pile was made with alternating wafers of silver and zinc, separated by brine-soaked pieces of cloth. When wires were attached, electrical current flowed. It was an instant success in the scientific community, and it spurred further research into electrochemistry, electromagnetism, and practical uses for electricity. His genius was so admired that Napoleon appointed him to the Legion of Honor and granted him a lifelong pension. He also made him a count. The Emperor of Austria named him Professor of Philosophy at Padua University in 1815. He taught there until 1819 when he retired and lived a quiet life until he died in the year 1827. The Volt was named to honor him in 1881. We all know the ancient Romans had their own system of numerals, which were always quite difficult to use, even for simple arithmetical calculations. So how did the modern Western society change the numeral system to the one we use today? The answer can be summed up with the name Leonardo Pisano, better known as Fibonacci. Leonardo of Pisa, not to be confused with Leonardo da Vinci, was born in 1174, almost 300 years before da Vinci. He was a contemporary of St. Francis of Assisi, the patron saint of Italy. In the Middle Ages, he would be called Leonardo Pisano. He was the son of Guglielmo Bonacci, and his modern name, Fibonacci, is derived from the Latin words Filius Bonacci, which mean son of Bonacci. Whatever you call him, he was the foremost mathematician of the Middle Ages. Though he was born in Pisa, he grew up and was educated in the Arab port city of Bugia, North Africa, where his father worked for the Pisan government taxing traders. It was here that he learned Hindu-Arabic numerals, the forerunner of today's modern numeral system. He quickly realized the Hindu-Arabic system was much easier to use for calculations than the clumsy Roman numerals. In addition, the Roman system lacked the concept of zero. Without this idea, modern mathematics would be impossible. Fibonacci traveled around the Mediterranean to Egypt, Sicily, Greece, southern France, and Syria. And as he traveled, he learned more about mathematics and the Hindu-Arabic numeral system, which he discovered was first devised in India. He wrote several books, which at the time had to be copied by hand because the printing press had yet to be invented. His most famous work is called Liber Abaci, or the Book of Calculation. The main purpose of the book was to encourage everyone to abandon Roman numerals and use the Hindu-Arabic system. It had a tremendous positive influence on calculations used for commerce 
and finance. Chapters showed how to calculate profit, interest, and currency conversions, and it covered topics such as multiplication, addition and subtraction, and division, all with the new number system. More advanced concepts such as quadratic equations, cube roots, proportion, and algebra were also discussed in this work. Most famously, Fibonacci considered the age-old mathematical problem called the rabbit problem. This problem is stated thusly. A man places a pair of rabbits into a garden surrounded by a wall. How many pairs of rabbits can be produced in a year if every month each pair produces a new pair, which from the second month on becomes productive? The answer to the problem has become known as the Fibonacci sequence. This list of numbers involves adding the preceding two numbers to form the next. Although this sequence was already known to Hindu mathematicians, it was Fibonacci's work that popularized the concept. The Fibonacci sequence is remarkable because of its appearance in the natural world, where it can be found in the spiral scales of pine cones and spiral parts of flowers. It is also used to plan works of art and architecture. Fibonacci did not merely copy the work of foreign mathematicians. He was a brilliant mathematician whose fame eventually spread to Frederick II, Holy Roman Emperor. Frederick challenged Fibonacci with several problems his own mathematicians could not solve. Fibonacci unraveled these problems and published them in his book, Phios, which appeared in 1225. In 1240, his home city of Pisa granted him a salary for his work. While little else is known of his life, it is presumed that he died before the year 1250.